And we're back to talk about how all this is impacting the campaign in 2016. Gwen Eiffel does double duty at PBS as moderator of Washington Week and co-anchor of the News Hour. Jerry Seib is the Washington bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal. Ben Dominich is the publisher of The Federalist. And Ed O'Keefe covers politics for The Washington Post. Before we get back to the bad news this week, there was a little good news that is breaking right now from the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. Good news for Jimmy Carter. He announced to his Sunday school class that his last scan means he's cancer free. The Sunday school class erupted in applause. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gwen, I want to start with you about the news this week. How do you think it's changed the race? Well, when the argument is about safety and about personal security and domestic security, it changes the race. Uh, right now, that leaves the, the Democrats we saw come out and talk instantly about gun control, and the president even started to in his interview with Nora O'Donnell, and then he pulled back a little bit afterward when he began to get, obviously, more information about what happened in San Bernardino. For Republicans, it's, it's going to be a ver variation of what we've seen so far, which is how can we be more alarmist than the last guy? So we saw Chris Christie this morning talking about it and, and at the same time taking little jabs at other candidates. We saw, of course, Donald Trump talking about political correctness as the root of all evil. And, and once you begin to move the discussion that way instead of what can you really do about it? And when you asked Donald Trump that, his answer was, you, you, kind of basically, you wait and see. Yeah, wait and see, Ben. What do you think? You, you know, I think it was interesting to see the reaction this week from uh, the New York Times, running that uh, front page editorial as they did, uh, going after uh, the gun issue. I think that there is a real gap between what the president is saying and what people understand as the reality of this situation. You are not going to defeat these elements of radicalized Islam in this country with gun control measures. That was not going to be something that would have prevented what happened in San Bernardino any more than you are going to defeat ISIS with a conference about the weather. This is not something that you are going to be able to achieve. And I think that the president in his address tonight is probably going to speak to these issues further. But Republicans actually, I think, have, uh, have the, the wind at their back when they are, are uh, running this criticism that basically the president is out of touch with reality and that this gun control measure, any gun control measure, is not the real solution. Jerry, where do you see the debate going from here? Well, I, I agree with Ben. I think, it, by and large, if security is the top issue, that probably tilts the, the, the dialogue a little bit toward the Republicans. Uh, we'll see how Hillary handles it. She's been trying all along to sound a little tougher than the president on all these issues, Syria, ISIS, and she'll continue to do that, I think. A couple of effects I think you saw right away. The Ben Carson fade continued because you don't want to look as if you're either too soft-spoken or inexperienced right now, and he's both. That doesn't work to his benefit. Um, Chris Christie, I think, has found a voice in a moment here. I mean, he talks about seven years' experience as a prosecutor handling terrorism cases. Well, this is a tailor-made moment for that. We'll see how far he can take that. And Bernie Sanders had a little bit of a hard time getting people to focus on income inequality in the last couple of weeks. Right. The race has kind of gone away to a set of issues that aren't great for Bernie Sanders. Ed, what do you think about the, the safety issue that Gwen's talking about? I mean, Donald Trump basically said, when this kind of thing happens, my poll numbers go up. And he's right. They do. Uh, they continue to. Every time we think one of these things happens, the general consensus immediately is, is that he's going to drop, and instead he just climbs or sustains his popularity. It's, it's terribly frustrating to everyone else, and it's a growing concern to Democrats. There was chatter in the last few days among congressional Democrats that the president had to come out and say something uh, to sort of set the mood, you know, acknowledge that this was everyone's worst fears realized, and try to move things forward. The problem is, absent anything specific, either on information from this investigation or his plans to do something, it's only going to amplify Republican attacks against him that he continues to have no strategy, that Democrats are going to lead the country into more attacks and absent any more aggressive military response. And Trump succeeds because he sounds a note of toughness and strength, which is completely vague. It's sort of, it's, it's compl it has no real seriousness Except behind it. Except I kept it. track of how many times John asked him about whether we'd be tracking Muslims, whether this is anti-Muslim, yes. four times at least. Yes. And each time he didn't answer the question. Yeah. So uh, he is also, at the same time as projecting strength, he's also stirring up a lot of uh, continuing to stir up a lot of unhappiness about a subset, three million people in this country. See, see, I mean, Trump is selling attitude, not agenda, right? So tough guy on immigrants, tough guy on the press, tough guy on ISIS, whatever it takes, you know, whoever. It, the problem is at some point, when I, I think you're right, it, does it become a, a, an issue that there's no substance or there are no details behind the toughness? Right now, not yet, but eventually, probably so. And I will say this. I was in, Je in uh, Iowa this week with Jeb Bush and, and spent more time than usual asking the people to show up, why bother? And increasingly, it was because I'm getting sick and tired of what I'm hearing from mm -hmm. Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. It's not specific. It's inflammatory. It's irresponsible. The party will lose because of him. So maybe there is something 
brewing that will cause Republicans to start it's looking elsewhere. It's not showing in the polls. Yeah, it is not saying, showing it at all. It is not <laughs> showing it. Now, polls because are lagging indicators, but there was evidence this week to suggest that perhaps in the coming weeks, there may be a little bit of a shift. Well, Ben, I, you know, you did interviews at the beginning of the Trump campaign, and people would say, well, by Labor Day, he'll fade, you know? <laughs> and then it was by, then it was by, you know, the beginning of December. Now it's well after the holidays. Uh, I, uh, I will believe that Trump has peaked uh, when he has peaked and right. not before. You, I think you actually have to see it happen before, uh, before anything else occurs. That may be the point where people actually have to show up in, in Iowa and, uh, and vote for him. But I think right now he speaks to a lot of people who are concerned that they don't trust uh, the, the elites in Washington at all. They don't trust them to be able to tell uh, good Muslims from bad. They don't trust them to be able to manage any of the crises that we've seen overseas or any of the domestic crises that they see at home. And so Trump speaks to that over and over again. And as and as uh, things break down, as things as people become concerned, they look for outsider voices. That's the role. Well, and when he when who they do trust, however, is the person when asked directly, "What would you do about this?" says, "I'll leave that to your imagination." <laughs> That's an acceptable answer. Jay, we, I was just going to say, we, we had an interesting piece in the journal uh, yesterday in Saturday paper that took a look at all the polling and tried to define who are the Trump voters. And he's created his own lane. It's not, he's singular. The, they're they're uh, more downscale economically. They're lesser educated. They're a new kind of Republican voters. And they're not concerned about values, social conservative values. They're not even concerned about issues. They are concerned about leadership. So he's got a, a group of, how big that group turns out to be ultimately is hard to say. But it's not like they're going to go away to somebody else because they're there because of him. I want to ask about the where else they might go and all those other candidates. But before we move off Trump, we've got a policy question. I, when you talk to Ash Carter, uh, Secretary of Defense, let's listen to what Donald Trump said about women in the military. Women in the military. Right. You uh, said in 2013, you said 26,000 unreported sexual assaults in the military, only 238 convictions. What did these geniuses expect when they put men and women together? Now the Pentagon has opened up all combat to women. What do you think? Well, it's a very tricky subject. You know, I mean, you're in there and you're fighting and you're sitting next to a woman. I mean, now, they want to be politically correct. They want to do it. But there are major problems. And as you know, there are many people that think this shouldn't be done at a high level, at a level of general. I think that it's a very tricky situation. But on Fox today, they had a woman who was a pilot, top level, very good, really indicating that this is really something that is not going to work out. Will it work out? I hope so. I can say this. The numbers of rapes in the military are through the roof, through the roof. Gwen, uh, Trump said major problems. There are other major the Marine. Commandant is not as supportive of this. No, so uh, the, Joe's, the, he happens to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff now, Joe Dunford, who was not in favor of this. But, uh, but using that reasoning, I'm sitting here as the only woman at this table, I should feel very insecure, right? Because you, you put I've the man next to I've never seen you be insecure. <laughs> when I feel, don't, sorry, okay. nobody's going to believe okay. that. Okay, but this is my point. <laughs> you put a man next to a woman and what, rapes occur? I mean, that's the reasoning here. Uh, the, the point that Ashton Carter made, the Secretary of Defense, is that this means that women can compete for these roles. They can compete to be Rangers. They compete to be Navy SEALs, but there's no guarantee they will be that, just like you can't guarantee that a man would be able to do these things. So what they're doing is opening up. I mean, women are, have been already been in combat roles, ground forces, since Leon Panetta did this. This is expanding it. There is some disagreement, as you would expect, at the Pentagon. There are problems military-wide with reporting sexual assault. That has been the case no matter what, and there are plenty of women serving in uniform who for whatever reason, are not comfortable reporting it. The last time there was a big social change, remember, was the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. The Marines were the same ones that expressed concerns. We've seen no real documented proof that it's caused unit cohesion issues. And so that, I think, is why Carter and others at the military feel comfortable moving on. Ben, let me ask you a question back on the question of politics. Ted Cruz is, uh, had basically assumed Donald Trump would fall, as many other people did. He hasn't. Is there a coming Cruz, Trump, Donnie Brook? You know, I'm not sure. I think that right now, uh, Ted Cruz certainly sounded a note of, of real challenge to Marco Rubio this week, went after him, uh, compared his policies on Libya to Hillary Clinton's in a very unfavorable way. I think we're at the beginning of what might be an interesting period of debate about the foreign policy of the nation, and it actually helps Ted Cruz to have uh, Donald Trump sounding sort of similar notes on the outskirts to be the more reasonable looking, uh, you know, uh, a presidential candidate uh, in, in the lane. It, it's a sort of a 
situation where you have to you have to pick your poison for for the establishment Republicans. Uh, and Ted Cruz's resume looks a little bit more like a presidential candidate's than Donald Trump's. I'll tell you what Ted Cruz has done very cleverly, which is first of all he has a base in the evangelical community that Donald Trump doesn't have. Mm -hmm. That's not going to go away. He's also he's also uh, realized that there's a big set of primaries on March 1st in the South where the evangelical vote's very important and where he's going to do well. So if he does well in Iowa and then can carry that into the South early in the calendar, not late in the calendar this year, he's not in a bad position. But I, I agree with Ben that the real fight right now is between Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, interestingly enough, because they've decided they're in the same space. And there's another element to that fight. Uh, Marco Rubio has focused on the fact that Ted Cruz was supportive of the legislation that took away the NSA's ability to get telephone records. What did we learn yesterday? That right now investigators can't get to the telephone records of the two people who committed this uh, atrocity in California. You better they can believe get to two years of them, not all right. five. Correct. So they Correct. can still get to some. Correct. Uh, but it doesn't matter. That's the argument that Rubio has been trying to make, and now he has great proof. Jeb Bush is beginning to make that argument as well. It will be a vulnerability for Cruz to explain why he was for that now, if he wants to be so tough against. I, I, I don't. I don't agree with that. I think that. I think that Cruz is actually well positioned on that front. It allows. It's one of the reasons he's been able to steal some of Rand Paul's voters away uh, on, by being a little bit libertarian on some of these things. And I think that also these phone records are they're after action things. They're not as it's it's more figuring out what happened in the lead up to this as opposed to preventing these actual deaths. Okay, Ben Dominus, thanks so much. Gwen, the shrinking violet, thank you. <laughs> Jerry, thank you. And Ed, I want to thank all of our panelists. We'll be back in a moment.